Today, allow me to share with you my take on mushrooms. Why amazing? Why nature's gift? Mushrooms are no strangers to us. Very popular and related to many uh, fairy tales like this one, Alice in Wonderland. They're also found on many items, decorative items, that we are familiar. They have been found in ancient drawings and sculptures, for example, in Algeria, way back in 3,500 before Christ, they had paintings on rocks. There were also large uh, stone structures resembling mushrooms in Kerala, also in the before Christ millennium. The Chinese, way back maybe 5,000 years ago, were using Ganoderma species as medicinal mushrooms. The icemen who were recovered were also found to be carrying mushrooms similar to Ganoderma, maybe also for medicinal purpose. We find them growing in forests, right? grassland, tree stumps, and some of them glow at night. Closer to home, you find them growing on your discarded wooden sandals or even your pata shoe brush and sometimes in your garden, especially if you have applied fresh compost. Now, who are the mushrooms? Mushrooms are macrophagi. They are not plant, nor animal, though they have some features, similar features. And they belong to the Sixth Kingdom, a kingdom that was specially created to accommodate the fungi. They're considered as nature's gift and definitely wonderful curiosities. Why? Mushrooms' body, you'll be surprised, is only threads like these called hypha. And when they grow as a network below the ground, they are called mycelia. And they have distinctive fruit body, which can appear suddenly overnight in some cases. They have multiplicity of shapes, colors, and gastronomic effects. Some are psychotic, some can be aphrodisiac, and some are even poisonous. Do mushrooms have a role in nature? Yes, they do. They play a very major role in recycling nutrients such as carbon and nitrogen, which are found in dead organic matter such as wood. Now, wood is a result of photosynthesis where plants fix carbon, nitrogen, to form their body. So it is the role of mushrooms to degrade this and return the nutrients to the environment. How do they do that? Mushrooms have a number of life strategies they use. Among them is the saprophytic mode, which is a good uh, life strategy of the mushrooms. What they do is they adhere and penetrate into the dead organic matters, example wood, which will then serve as nutrient source or as well as a support. Then they will digest the polymers in the wood, in this case the complex polymer cellulose, which is actually made of building blocks of glucose. So once they break down the cellulose, the glucose is then their nutrient. We actually follow this and mimic what is happening in nature into cultivation of mushroom, where the wood will be the sawdust plus the other nutrients to support its growth, and we end up having commercial cultivation of mushrooms. There is also a downside to this saprophytic mode. Mushrooms cannot differentiate which wood they should degrade and which wood they shouldn't degrade. So be aware, they might end up degrading your wooden staircase because their role in nature is to degrade complex material back into simple molecules. I dare not say mushrooms have no brain because some of the things they do is far beyond our comprehension. So I refrain from that. This is the downside, okay, which we have to be aware. The second strategy, a very interesting strategy, is the symbiotic mode. And as we all know, symbiosis means both partners will benefit from this relationship. 
Here, mushrooms grow, or their mycelium, grow as adaptive networks, which helps in communication and biotransport. They're highly responsive to local environmental conditions. They can transport nutrients between spatially separated sources. So in this diagram, you can see they are actually sharing. The plant makes the food via photosynthesis, gives the mushroom which cannot photosynthesize its food. The mushroom in return will capture nutrients and water and supply via the roots to the mushroom. Now, why is this mode interesting? If we look at this, can we have a winning collaboration, a social network of plants, trees, fungi, and other related microbes in the soil ecosystem? Let me give you an example to trigger your mind. Trees that get attacked by bugs release chemical signals, which are then picked up by the fungal mycelium. See, they are interrelated. And transported via this internet of mycelium to neighboring trees that receive the signals and increase their own resistance to the threat. Interesting, isn't it? Can this be a potential to understand biocontrol of plant pathogens and pests? Believe me or not, when fungi want to live within the roots of plants or on the surface of plant, they do ask the plant for permission. Why is it then? we have problems such as this. The parasitic mode is the third problem that we face, and this is also a life strategy of mushrooms. They live on or in the roots, and they obtain nutrients from the host. This is via the enzymatic reaction which they, they have. They break down the complex molecule to simple molecules, or in some cases, they also secrete toxins. What they do in the case of the oil palm pathogen, the Ganoderma pathogen, it will penetrate the water channels in the plant. And what will happen when the mycelium fully colonizes the water channel? They clog the channel. Then the plant will wilt and die. But I remember I told you plants, fungi must ask permission from the plant before they can colonize the plant. What went wrong? This is what we can learn from understanding how mushrooms function in the environment. So because of their numerous life strategies, mushrooms are exploited by human, animal, and plants. Plants, as I mentioned, mycorrhiza, that means they grow extensively with the root system, contributing to plant health. They are cultivated or farmed by termites and ants. Why? Because when termites cut the wood, they take it back to the nest, they have no way of converting the complex wood to sugar, which will feed the queen and the colony members. Only the fungi can do this. So who is, and believe me, this fungi do not have an independent life. That means out of the ant's nest, they have no life. They live in a symbiotic relationship, mutually benefiting each other. Humans also, exploit mushrooms, main, uh, mainly to grow as food. And once we have grown the mushroom, there are many other products that we can get from this. And they will, I'll explain later in my slide. So because there are many, many applications, I would just like to touch on a couple because I don't have the time. And still health is the most important issue we all face. How can we take mushrooms from forest to market? How can we tap wild resources, domesticate them, grow them from the wild state or even the temperate state right up to commercial levels? This is what we will do. So mushroom from wellness actually comes from the ecosystem. You can also learn to use mushroom based on traditional knowledge like our tiger milk mushroom. But most of the time we will be hunting in the forest and if there is any traditional knowledge associated, we will collect those mushrooms and try to bring to cultivation levels. I would like to share here how we managed in our long history of study, starting in the early 2000s, domesticated the lion's mane mushroom, which is a temperate mushroom, 
tasty. Many people like it for its uh, seafood-like taste, though some say it's a bit bitter. But it is said to have a couple of signature medicinal properties. Based on ethnomycological knowledge in Japan and China, they say this mushroom is good for the brain. It will stimulate production of what is known as nerve growth factor in the nerve cells. Now we did this study, we wanted to know why NGF is important. When we have NGF in the nerve cell, they will allow the branching of these branches to be formed. And these are the branches that will establish connectivity in among the nerve cells. Connectivity is very important for brain functioning. As we age, we may tend to lose some of this connectivity and will lion's mane mushroom be useful? It's for us to do research and answer the questions. Since we found that there are principles in the lion's mane mushroom which can contribute to nerve branching, the question we asked it, will it help to sort of cure injured nerves or recover or restore function of injured nerves enhancingly? When will this happen? Injury occurs in motor vehicle accidents, fractures and even dislocation. And what will happen when we injure our nerves? We lose function, including movement if the damage is severe. We investigated this in animal trials using the lion's mane mushroom, and we found that there are principles in this mushroom which will speed up recovery of uh, injured nerves and restore loss uh, the function. Another aspect or another potential application that I would like to touch on also from our research is bioremediation. The white rod fungi are the fungi that grow on woody substrates. We call them white rod fungi because this is a physiological condition. The wood will appear bleached, as you can see here. All right. These mushrooms, they produce enzymes, a whole uh, array of enzymes known as lignin-modifying enzymes. And these play a very important role in degradation and recycling, as we have seen earlier. And we can recycle uh, agro-based residues from using this type of fungi. Now here, what I would like to highlight is the lignin-modifying enzyme. Unlike what we know about enzymes, one enzyme, one substrate reactions, the non-specific nature of these enzymes is what we will tap. To in our bioremediation endeavors. So here what we did, we actually got spent bags. These are bags that are left over after the mushrooms are harvested. We extracted the enzyme and then we tried to decolorize dyes. And this we saw there is potential. At least in lab scale, we have shown that it works. So to, unable to go through every aspect with you, I'm going to now put it all into one figure. The mycelium, mushroom mycelium, we grow it in organic matter. This can be rice straw, rubber wood sawdust, and such organic residues. Of course, I've mentioned about the mushroom fruit putting bodies that we can form. From that, we can have mushroom products, different types of edible products, finger food, nuggets. We can also develop into some therapeutic uh, products as well. I also mentioned about the bioremediation aspects, but there's much more we can do with the sense pen substrate, that is the waste. We can convert it to soil fertilizer, we can convert it to animal feed and aqua feed, and also as a raw starting material for bioenergy, biogas production. So here we say if we cultivate mushrooms, we get the circular economy ecosystem, we can use agricultural residues which are renewable in a sustainable and organic manner and achieve zero waste. All right, usually what we do with the organic waste is we convert it to fertilizer or maybe straight away convert it to bioenergy. So here is a system where will allow us to tap maximum. So it's from waste to wealth kind of endeavor. Now coming to mushrooms, I've told you it can be eaten, they do a lot of good things for us. 
they are also the bad guys, all right? The bad guys or the mush poisonous mushroom, the one in the picture is chlorophyllum molybdides, which is, uh, causes a lot of problem. A lot of people eat it, not because knowingly, but a mistaken identity. And this is one of the major uh, mushrooms, um, major cause of poisoning in our Malaysian scenario. Now here I show you, try to guess. If we look at the mushroom, this is the young mushroom. So these are also young mushroom. To someone who's not familiar with mushroom, they will not be able to differentiate at this stage. Can they eat or they cannot eat? So what's the, most of the time in the young stage, which is the most tastiest uh, um, time of the mushroom or the state to be eaten, and the termite mushroom is the most tastiest mushroom. Those who have eaten the chendawan busut, uh, they know about this. What will happen is only when they mature, when we look at the gills, we find that the poisonous one has green colored gills. So most times people collect it, either uh, thinking it is the one that they always eat, or they might have accidentally collected this together with the termite mushroom, which appears after a heavy rainfall, all right, and end up eating. So this is the only one we can safely eat. Of course, there are other features which I don't want to go into right now. Okay, given the shortage of time, I need more time to talk about mushrooms. I would like to t leave you with some take home messages. One is know the mushrooms we can eat. Be careful when you forage for mushroom, you know what you have picked. Just because some insect is eating it does not mean it's safe for you. So know your mushroom because we can eat the mushroom only once and there are deadly ones that will cause death. The other thing is learn how mushrooms impact our lives, how we can do biocontrol by learning what is happening there below in the soil, or how we can recover from the, uh, the environment, the pollutants, detoxify using the mushroom as our agent. I always think, think out of the box to reap their bountiful gifts to us. When the lion's mane reach our shores, many of us thought, oh, it's a temperate mushroom, no way we are going to grow in this blistering hot climate of ours. But still somewhere along the line in our group, we found out that yes, it can fruit in Malaysia. And today you can get fresh lion's mane to enjoy. Can we think like mushroom? Think about it. Mushrooms without leaves, without buds, without flowers, they form fruit. As a food, as a tonic, as a medicine, the entire creation is pressure. Enjoy your mushrooms as much as I enjoy them. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for Academy Science Malaysia for giving this opportunity to share a little bit of my thoughts on mushroom. Of course, to my alma mater, University of Malaya, and of course, Mushroom Research Center, also from University of Malaya. Have a nice day and enjoy a mushroom meal, if not tonight, tomorrow.